captain's log. Stardate 41235.25. Our location, planet Ligon 2. Source of a rare vaccine needed on Federation planet Styrus 4. Starfleet has instructed me to engage in a friendly visit and open treaty negotiations to acquire this medicinal substance. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske File. We are continuing our Star Trek The Next Generation walkthrough, walkthrough or uh, let's watch with Code of Honor. The fourth episode of the first season is directed by Russ Mayberry and Les Landau and written by Catherine Powers and Michael Barron. So let's get to what this episode is about. The Enterprise arrives at planet Ligon 2 to acquire a vaccine needed to combat an outbreak of Achilles fever on Cyrus 4. The crew, possessing little information on the Ligonian culture, finds it follows strict customs of status similar to ancient Africa. Specifically, while the men in their culture rule society, the land itself is controlled by the women. Luton, the Ligonian leader, transports up to the Enterprise to provide a sample of the vaccine and is impressed by Lieutenant Tasha Yar's status as head of security. Yar further demonstrates her Aikido skills against a holographic opponent for Lutan on the holodeck. After a tour of the ship, Lutan and the Ligonians abduct Yar as they transport back to the surface of the planet. Captain Jean-Luc Picard demands that Lutan return Yar considering the kidnapping an act of war, but receives no response from the planet. After consultation with his officers, Picard determines that Lutan took Yar in a counting coup as a show of her uh, heroic action. Picard contacts Lutan in a more peaceful manner who grants permission for the Enterprise crew to beam down to the planet and promises to return Yar after a banquet in his honor. Lutan announces at the banquet that he will make Yar his first one, surprising not only the Enterprise crew but also Irina, who believed that she was already selected by Lutan. Uh, Irina is the first wife who is already there. Irina challenges Yar to a fight to the death to claim back the position, and while Picard objects to the fight, Lutan refuses to give the Enterprise the rest of the vaccine unless Yar participates. The crew investigates the combat ritual and finds that the weapons are use, used are coated with a lethal poison, and also that is Yarina's wealth to which Lutan owes his position. Picard preca- uh, prepares to have Yar beam back to the Enterprise should be, she be harmed in the battle. As the match progresses, both Yarina and Yar are equally skilled, but Yar eventually lands a strike on Yarina. Yar quickly covers Yarina and orders the transport of both of them to the Enterprise against the demands of Lutan. Aboard the ship, Dr. Beverly Crusher reaches Yurina moments after death, but is able to counteract the poison and revive her. When Lutan demands to know the fate of Yurina, Crusher reveals that Yurina died, thus ceding the match to Yar and breaking the first one bond. Yurina is now free to select a new mate. She chooses Hagon, one of Lutan's bodyguards, and effectively strips Lutan of his position of power. Hagon lets Yar go and gives the Enterprise their full supply of vaccine. So, let's get to our thoughts about the episode. First Officer's Log, Supplemental. Captain Picard, faced with a critical need for a vaccine produced on this planet, has permitted Lieutenant Natasha Yar to engage in a fight to the death. I have yet to understand his reasoning or his plan. All right, so this is Code of Honor, the fourth episode of the first season of Star Trek. Uh, I guess to sort of bury the lead, <laughs> or whatever the saying is, um, this is not a very good episode of Star Trek. This is, I think it's considered one of the worst, and it's easy to see why. It's a um, it's a very weakly written episode that is basically comes across as racist and sexist all in one. Uh, so it definitely has an age well, and I can get into a little bit of the backstory, I guess, about it uh, after I've discussed it. But yeah, even at the time it was made, it was sort of controversial, and it is a very strange episode where this alien uh, Ligonian race is basically portrayed as a African tribe. And the problem is that all the people who are cast are black. So it leads to this weird racist type thing. And I think uh, you could have gotten around it if you hadn't cast the entire alien culture as black people. Because it makes it very obvious what you're going for. But they are very... uh they fa- fall into a lot of sort of black stereotypes. It's like they're highly sexual. They're very interested in this white woman. And they're very violent. And they are uh, not monogamous. So it fits these weird sort of black stereotypes to a T. And it's incredibly awkward. They walk and talk as if they are an African tribe. Uh, they sort of have this very stilted, honor-bound culture. And it's sexist in the sense that for no particular reason at all, Yar is like enamored by being kidnapped by them. They have these very strange scenes where Troy asks her if she's basically 
you know, pleas to be kidnapped. And Yara, asks, uh, Yara acts as if it's a trick question when she admits that, yeah, she's a little turned on, basically, by this guy who's kidnapped her and wants to fight for her. So it's this strange situation where a woman gets kidnapped, a white woman gets kidnapped by a black guy, and then the white woman is just enamored with this, uh, with her kidnapper. While all the while the black tribe is basically acting as stereotypically as you can uh, without going completely out of bounds. But it's an awkward episode. The crew and the cast were not pleased with it when it came out. It, um, I guess I can go into it now, but the director, who's, what's his name? The uh, Russ Mayberry. This is his one and only episode of directing. I guess he was the one responsible. He's the director of the episode. He was the one responsible for the casting, it seems. This is what I've gathered from reviewing. And so he was fired halfway through the episode. Um, some were saying because of the casting decision, and some were saying he was being racist to the actual cast as they were filming this episode. So he was fired halfway through, and the first assistant director, who's Les Landau, I guess, finished the work. But yeah, it seems to... Uh, it comes across very strange. Uh, outside of that awkwardness, which I guess is enough to really knock it down into the sort of bottom of the barrel... The, uh, it's a, it's sloppy. It continues this next generation thing of, uh, no one seems to have particular roles on this ship. They willingly let Wesley Crusher just sort of come onto the bridge. Uh, it's got this very loosey goosey. There's no, there's no rank or roles to anybody's interactions, really. Wesley can just sort of walk onto the bridge. This is like a, you know, this is a starship and basically like preceding a war event here. And Wesley's just allowed to sit at ops. Fly around, do whatever. Uh, Riker, Troy. Troy actually does serve a purpose in this. She is much more of a counselor role uh, in terms of counseling the captain about what's going on. She actually uses her betazoid um, emotion sensing a couple times in this episode, too, without being too awkward or dramatic like she has been in previous episodes. But it's um, it continues this very weak sort of characterization about what's going on. The, the, there's no particular roles that people go to. Riker sticks up and says that he wants to go down to the planet, but because the Ligonians are so honor-bound, only Picard should go down, or at least they'll respect him a little bit more. Uh, it's got a lot of bad fight scenes, which are terrible. It's got a lot of bad lines. Uh, the script is very dull, very boring. Um, they were saying when, you know, when the uh, showrunner at the time was saying that he didn't think the idea was bad. He thought the execution was terrible, and I guess he would be talking about hiring all black actors to play this role. But the um, he's saying that he was interested in the storyline where a person kidnaps somebody basically just to sort of gain wealth for himself, which is the plot line of this, where if uh, Yar wins, then this uh, Lutan will gain the property of his ex-first wife, and then he'll have Yar as well. So it's not sheer uh, sexual you know, promiscuity or anything. I guess there is sort of a logic to what he's doing, and that story is okay, but it is hidden behind all these awkward, weird things. Um, outside of that, it's got a lot of sloppy, sloppy either writing or production work going. There's Picard, in one of the captain's log, pronounces uh, Lutan differently. He pronounces once Lutan, and then he says Luton. Um, so there's all kinds of weird things like that going on where they can't get the pronunciation correct, and even in the same... I would assume it's the same take. It's pronounced twice, uh, two different ways. But the other, uh, another, another weak aspect would be the vaccine is sort of a MacGuffin, which is a, a MacGuffin is like a, an event or an item in a TV show that sort of propels the plot forward. Um, so there's, if it weren't for this vaccine, it would be very easy to just transport Yar out of there and escape. But the, uh, the crew is dealing with this vaccine problem with a scarlet fever or something going on on another planet and millions of people are dying and so they're bound to get this vaccine from these people and they can't violate the first uh, prime directive or anything like that although I thought the prime I thought first contact was they would not talk to people or make contact with other races until they had like warp flight I don't, I don't think these guys have warp flight they don't seem to be able to move around in space they just have this vaccine, and they seem extremely primitive, like even, you know, just sort of honor-bound. Uh, they're very Klingon-esque in how they are, but I thought First Contact was reserved for people who uh, traveled faster than light, but I guess maybe this uh, gets around it somehow. But Picard does complain about the Prime Directive in this episode as a reason why they can't just take Yar and leave, um, because that would be interfering with their cultural development, even though someone wrongs you, which is a weird ethical thing, I think, that... Uh, Star Trek occasionally covers 
there's one episode coming up later where people talk about the Prime Directive much more um, involved. I think it's the one where Riker goes to a planet and is discovered before our first contact, something like that. And there's the whole ethical thing about what when do you interfere. But this is a very prototypical type episode dealing with that stuff. It's not really important. The vaccine exists only to keep people on the planets instead of just beaming them up and zooming off. Um, so there is... Uh, there's a couple good things to this episode, if not good things, there's a couple interesting things that are worth mentioning. I think this is the first episode that shows Jordy and Data as friends. Um, they have a, they have a strange scene where Jordy is shaving, and Data uh, is talking to him about sense of humor and jokes. It has nothing to do with the plot, really, which is uh, another common theme of these early episodes. But it's the first scene where they actually act like they are the best friends that they would soon become as the series goes on. Uh, they have a lot of that Geordi laughing at Data as Data tries to understand what humanity is. And so that was nice to have that scene. This is the very first one, I think. Before that, they weren't really particularly close. You never saw them uh, acting close. And the other thing is that this is the first time you see the holodeck sort of deactivated, which is the black room with the yellow uh, cross pattern or uh, checkered pattern, I guess. It's not really checkered, but the lines, the yellow lines in the black holodeck. And it's the first time you see that. We've only seen the holodeck when a uh, program has been running, like in the pilot episode where Riker goes in to meet Data, and there's a program of, like, a forest. So that's interesting. The the, uh, the holodeck is going to come back in a big way, obviously. Not not a lot of people's favorite episodes, the holodeck episodes, but uh, either way, this is the early, early stuff that you get to see from them. Uh, but, yeah, those are the two basic good things, if not good things, at least stuff that sort of stuck around. Uh, the rest of the episode is pretty awful. The plot's silly. There's the weird Crusher and Picard interaction where <laughs> Crusher goes into the red room and tells Picard that people are dying from this. And has he ever held someone who's dying from scarlet fever or whatever this disease is called? It's not called scarlet fever. What is it called? Oh, uh, I can't. And Achilles fever. And Achilles fever. And Picard goes, no, but I have experienced death, which is an obvious callback to uh, Wesley Crusher's line from the pilot where Picard delivered his father's dead body to him and Dr. Crusher. So that was a, it's a little bit of a personal dig. I don't know how, how well that would go over in the real world is, uh, is bringing that up as somebody, but it's another awkward Crusher Picard thing. The show I see, I guess, seems to be trying to hint at something to them, but their exchanges are so stilted and strange that it's uh, really hard to figure out. And then we see uh, Wesley Crusher, who is not too obnox- obnoxious in this episode, but he is on the bridge for no particular reason, which doesn't make sense in the context of the show. He is wearing the same sweater he was wearing in the pilot, I think, the enormous space sweater. So that shows how uh, how low budget I think the show was or at this point or what they could afford. He's wearing the same exact clothing. It makes no sense. Everyone's wearing the same uniform, so you figure they got more than one uniform. This kid's only got one sweater. It continues the weird thing of Data being too informative. Uh, this time Data insults French, which upsets Picard. You know, French is the language of civilization, he tells Data. Data thinks that French is a obscure language from Earth. And everyone laughs at him. And it has another scene of Data telling too much information. Although when he uh, is explaining why they can't beam people back, or why they can't find where the Ligonians took Yar... He explains why it happens, because they use some sort of weird transport technology. But I felt like that was an explanation that would have made sense. He cuts himself off. No one even interrupts him. And he says he's being too informative. But I felt that was the one time where his information was actually relevant and useful. So that was a weird scene. And then the uh, the fight scene is particularly atrocious. Although it looks much better in the HD on Amazon, the streaming version here. The lights of the uh, arena, I guess, where Yar and Yarina fight look much, much nicer in this HD version than they do uh, in the original version. They they certainly don't look realistic or as if they're energy. I think they're supposed to be energy beams, like glowing uh, uh, yellow beams that the fighters seem to be avoiding. But they look nice in HD. They look ultra set-y, like, a, like they were constructed and built in like a set. But they, uh, they do glow nicely, and so that's a very nice thing. And... Yar, for some reason, has a headband, even though her hair is probably shorter than mine. It's like an inch long. And I don't know why she would need a headband, but she has one to fight with her uh, spiked mace hand weapon. So, yeah, not a, not a lot going on in this episode. Another bad plot. Another silly 
uh, sort of premise, the racism and sexism is stupid. The character interactions don't make a lot of sense. It feels very loose about what the characters have there for their motivations. Uh, Dr. Crusher continues to be a weird, underused character. Wesley Crusher continues to just be up there for no particular reason. And Yar is basically, for someone who's, I think it does, this episode does a lot of like disservice to Yar's character. It makes, it makes really no sense. We know from previous episodes she was raised on like a hostile planet with rape gangs. And so she was raised in this horrible, horrible situation on like basically a, uh, like, lawless planet so you think she would be a little bit more hard-edged or something but she's extremely flippy floppy and how the writers portray her which might be why denise crosby leaves eventually but it's um she does not stay consistent in any of the episodes that you see it's when her inhibitions went down and the naked now she's sort of you know like flirty and sleeps with data uh she's portrayed as this hardcore aggressive security chief but then she's smitten by this guy who abducts her she has no she has no center to her character which is very problematic and doesn't really make any sense and uh, she's taking screen time from Worf I don't think Worf even appears in this episode Worf's role is kind of useless at this point Yar is there but the she's the most flippy floppy of the uh, characters so far everyone else is kind of rounding into what they would eventually be um, Yar continues to just sort of hedge on both sides which is frustrating you know for if you think that she's supposed to be this badass security guard you think she'd be a little bit more uh, aggressive and sort of strong-willed and it's shown that she is the opposite of that in every situation we've seen she is the first one to sort of flip-flop back and forth between how she feels and what's going on and it's like this weird sexist thing in this episode so not a good showing for yar not a good showing for the writers, and not a good showing for Russ Mayberry, who directed this and was fired halfway through for his poor, poor casting decisions. Uh, just a little bit of other trivia on this one, if not trivia. I guess um, Jonathan Frakes wanted this episode to never be aired again after it had aired the first time. He sought to prevent it from being re-aired. Wesley Crusher reviewed it in 2008. He said he didn't remember appearing in the episode, and it was the first time since originally broadcast that he had seen it. He said it wasn't good, but it was not, quote, as overtly racist as I recalled. I mean, it's certainly not as racist as Angel 1 is sexist, and if the Ligonians hadn't been arbitrarily determined to be entirely African-American, it wouldn't have even been an issue, which I guess is true. But it is, um, they were all African-American, and it made it painfully obvious what the, uh, what the writers were going for. It's honestly as if you just cast all Asian people and just like they were terrible at driving, you know, the spaceships and they did math really well. It was, it was basically on that level. Really stupid. 1987. And, uh, yeah, a lot of other reviews just don't have a very good things to say about this. AV Club gave it a C minus. Um, said, I'm not sure I'd believe a great show could come out of the next generation after watching this episode, but at least I can say it had promise without sounding like a complete tool, which I don't really know. I don't think the episode's all that good. Uh, and Tor.com in 2011 said the episode is riddled with cliché and that it seems racist because of the casting, even though the script didn't call for it, which was true. Uh, he gave it a 2 out of 10. <laughs> the Trek Nation thought the episode was badly paced, which I agree with. Uh, not a lot happens in this episode, and the fight scene at the end was truly clunky and awkward, which it absolutely was. Uh, yeah, so that's it. That is Code of Honor, another bad episode of Star Trek. But I think the next one coming up, what is next? The Last Outpost. Maybe that's not the best one, but we do get a couple decent episodes coming up pretty soon, so I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, let me know what you thought about Code of Honor. If you liked this episode or what you think, leave a comment. Otherwise, if you uh, don't mind, if you could throw a like on this video, that would be greatly appreciated. I do like doing this stuff, and I will keep doing it, even if no one watches it. That is fine by me, but I'm enjoying this. Code of Honor was enjoyable to watch for how bad it was, and I will come back in a couple days with The Last Outpost. So, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you later.